Hi everybody. So allow me to introduce to you. Um, you know, apart from being uh, uh, the, the top brass, one of the top brasses at iHeartMedia, um, Tom is also a really good friend of mine. And um, you know, it was we were lucky enough for him to actually take the time out here and really, really appreciate it to come here. So, and you look at these financial guys that were up here. They come out on a Saturday. And Tom came from uh, during the week just to come and observe everything and here to give his keynote to, to, to you this evening. Tom, welcome to Jamaica and Thank welcome you. to IMC. Thank you very much. Well, um, first of all, condolences to your family. Thank you, thank you. I know it's been, a, it's been a crazy day and a crazy week for you. So the fact that you're uh, taking the time out to do this conference has been extremely impressive uh, to me. I have, uh, I think we've known each other since about 94 or so. Yeah. And then uh, when I started at Z100 in New York in 96, that's when things really blew up. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, it's I, been I a really, nice journey. I really appreciate the, <laughs> the friendship and um, just all that we've done together. Um, so, I, many of you probably have no idea who I am or why I'm here. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what, I came here because I wanted to learn. Uh, first of all, I do whatever Shaggy tells me to do. But uh, second of all, um, I'm always interested in, in learning about what the next big thing is. Um, I've been doing radio since 1983, and uh, I've been running iHeartMedia's programming for the last 12 years or so. Um, and a lot, I, I've seen so many different um, cycles of music. And one thing that I have always been impressed with is the durability and the passion for any pop music that's infused with reggae uh, or, or any derivative of, of reggae. Um, the first song that I played on the radio in the U.S. in, in 83 uh, was a police song, you know, and, and that was uh, derivative, obviously, of reggae, and I know that you're good friends with Sting. Um, and then in the 90s, I think our most played song was uh, UB40. Um, and in, in the 80s, our, our most played song, I think, was a police song, Every Breath You Take. And then, and then the 80s, uh, UB40, uh, then you know, Shaggy, Sean Paul, Maxi Priest, all these different sounds have always risen to the top of the pop charts. I oversee all, all formats in the US. Um, we can talk about that in, in a minute, but um, I've always really, really focused on pop radio at Z100 in New York and KISS in LA. We have the, the most pop radio stations in America. And I'm always interested in the pop songs that, influ that, that infuse these sounds, because I know that they're going to be uh, enduring the test of time. So, Yeah, so when you talk about those songs, right? I, I gave a story earlier uh, a couple of weeks days ago. So Ken Berry was, uh, the, who was the head of Virgin at the time. And, um, you know, the UB40 songs that you talk about, whether it be Red Red Wine or, or I Can't Help Fall in Love, which is from the Promises and Lies album, which sold about 17 million. If you look at all these massive, massive songs, um, that is, is a lot of them are reggae infused or reggae. Like the, the Police was really the first white reggae band. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I remember Sting telling me a story uh, that you know, he said, Shaggy, I used to go and, and watch Family Man and watch these guys as a bass player, and I tried to emulate what, he, what they were doing, and I couldn't. And what I did was, what he did was a, 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 a uh, uh, kind of a hybrid uh, sound of it, you know, and that became the sound of the police, you know what I mean? So it was really him trying to emulate what these, these, these guys yeah. are doing. But the point I'm trying to get to it, was it Ken Berry says to me, he says, Shaggy, you know, one thing with a reggae song, they don't come very often, but when they come, boy, are they huge. And I said to him, wouldn't it be great if the industry and the record companies invest a little bit more into these reggae acts, right, so that we can have more of these huge songs because it's not a format. And... I said to them the other day, I said, 
You guys have a, how many stations do you have? We have uh, 860 stations 800, in the U.S. Almost 900 stations in the United States. This is, this is the biggest media radio platform in, in, in the United States, right? And they don't have a reggae station. They have reggae programs. And it's not like they don't like reggae because... If I can fact check you for a second. Fact we have check. A, we, we have, have a, a reggae station in Hawaii that is full full, full reggae. reggae. Yeah. And our, on our app, we have over, you know, 45 Oh, yeah, you got them on players. the apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yeah, can talk about yeah. that in a second. Right. Well, that's, that's great. Thank God. But um, it's not that they don't like reggae because you guys have been, you know, having so much... Even your founder, uh, well, not the founder, your, your chairman, which is... Yeah. And CEO, uh, Bob Pittman, uh, has a home here and been living in Jamaica for years. And is very, very um, connected with the island. And he and I are pretty good friends, and we have always talked about how we could actually make reggae, push reggae in the right position. So, but we need to have the tools, the type of songs to work on your stations that you guys could pray because you have to make each market work, right? Yeah. Tell me what is it that we need as artists on the, on the music side to really get that is programmable for you guys. Yeah, all right. So let me talk a little bit about the landscape of media in the U.S., all right? And, and, and I like that we call this uh, a discussion about the music ecosystem because I believe it's all these different pieces of the equation that come together, okay? Um, we're, think, think of radio and especially iHeartRadio, is the way that you really um, can get that big consensus hit to the masses. We reach 90% of America every month, and um, we turbocharge what we see emerging, okay? So, uh, and I love that uh, there's been so many excellent panels, uh, TikTok, Meta, um, YouTube, all of these are pieces of the music uh, metaverse or, or universe, and um, we're, 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 I think, one of those final key pieces of the equation when you really want to go to the masses, okay? Um, not everybody, I mean, TikTok is probably one of the most influential um, ways in YouTube right now to uh, develop a song. It's an early indicator, and it's obviously driving a ton of the consumption uh, with the masses. We watch it every single week in our music meetings, all, all of consumption. And then we look for the right ones that are exploding to then take to the masses. Okay? Because not all of them that are successful on TikTok actually oh, yeah. work on radio either. Yeah, so I have a stat, because uh, we, we look at uh, the data consumption constantly. And a, a TikTok song typically that'll break to the masses will stream for about 5.3 weeks. If you add once, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up at radio and develop it as well. Uh, and we find that it goes for about 12.8 weeks. So, and, and, it, and it starts to reach those people, those, those uh, different demographics and um, folks that aren't on TikTok every day. You know, people will always talk about, oh yeah, I heard Lizzo, you know what I mean? I know, I know uh, that was enormous on TikTok, but most of the people ultimately in the masses, it's because we pound it on, on the radio every hour. That's, that's what we do. We're a high reach and frequency medium. So we're that uh, sort of big piece that will lead to even greater exposure with the masses. Reaching the masses is definitely a trick in America. I mean, not everybody is on the social platforms. And again, I'm not taking a shot at social platforms. I'm just saying that it is a piece of the puzzle, like radio is a piece of the puzzle. Radio is what you use for uh, mass um, and at the right time. And the way you get our attention is through all those different platforms as well. So. I, I like if you're an emerging artist, and I, I promise you, there's going to be somebody out of this conference that we're going to be playing uh, on our iHeart radio stations, and I'm I'm excited about finding who that next person's going to be. I was saying to Shaggy that you know that that's kind of 
what I'm looking for while I'm here. I'm hanging out, talking. I think I've gotten about 70 numbers <laughs> from people, everybody that I meet, and it's great. I'm loving uh, learning. But I do know that there's going to be somebody that whether it's uh, a song by themselves or a song that is infused in another pop um, collaboration or hip hop, um, it, it's going to connect. And the, the way to sort of seed it, I think, to us is to start thinking about how you're building impressions. And impre because all of those impressions add up as a key um, foundation of the music system. We'll add impressions, but the, the impressions that you build, maybe even before you're assigned to a, a label, are we're, we're, we're going to see those indicators bubble up. And then we're going to look for things that are taking off. And if you can make that happen, then we're going to jump on board. So what would you say to some people now who there those who are out there because music is consumed on so many different platforms now they're consumed on YouTube uh, they're consumed on on obviously you spoke about TikTok in so many different ways um, what about what about those who argue that radio is not as relevant as it used to be right do you think there's some fact to that or, or not? I think uh, the, the ecosystem is just more complex now. I think uh, radio uh, for a long time was the only way that you could hear about music, um, but it's still a huge driver, again, for the masses to become aware uh, of music. And, and look, I think it's great that the barrier of entry has um, has changed. Has changed. Yeah. But I, I, I think don't look at it as one or the other. I think it's about having a plan to take advantage of every avenue that you can and look at them in an aggregate to how they create mass awareness. And then, you know, there was a great panel yesterday uh, where you were talking about content. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments that I really loved, and I can't remember who said it, but think about not just the short form, but have a strategy for the long form as well. And that really resonated with me because so many of the TikTok songs, they're fantastic moments, right? And they're hooks and they're great dances and they're, 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 they're engaging. I've seen so many of those songs not translate to radio because they weren't anything but a hook, right? But the ones that do translate are the ones that have a, a wider view of that piece of music. How can this really be a song? Um, yeah. But it, the, 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 and, and just to the TikTok thing, that's why it is, in, it is essential that if you have a song, say, say you, you have a song, and it start going good on TikTok, what you should do is right away get that song, reproduce it properly, right, and make sure it is a proper song. When we did Banana, um, and that took off with the drop, slip with it, crew drop when they're dropping the glasses, we reproduced that whole song back over, make sure that it was a song in length where you start. Remember now, songwriting is a craft. There's a way that it is done. We made sure that was there. We put better sounds around it. You know, we put, we put better production around it. We redid the video over and got Jay Will to do a, do a more expensive video because the record was taken off because we wanted it to resonate with radio. The sad part about that record is it happened right in the middle of a pandemic. So we couldn't work it to radio. Which, right. which, uh, but that became a two billion stream song. Imagine if radio, we could have gone to radio and worked that. So we didn't even put a radio budget because we couldn't travel. Right. Which leads me to the point of traveling. And, uh, you guys, most likely, when there's an artist that have a record that is bubbling on iHeart and is happening, if the artist is not willing to support the record, chances are that record would not go very far. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, you know, we want to develop a, a real career and a real artist. And, and part of that is being able to showcase all different pieces of uh, what that artist can offer. It's not just playing the song on the radio. It's um, having them come on our morning shows. A lot of what we do well in radio is give context uh, to the song and the artist, you did interviews with uh, in this week, and can, can we talk about this, by the way? 
We, we, I think I think we, I think we, I think we I, can. Yeah, because they just they just post something on it. Okay. Well, so as you know, Shaggy has a song that'll be airing in the Super Bowl. Do we do, actually do you want to give the details? There's a song coming in the in the in the Super Bowl. Um, we have a Super Bowl song, which is uh, "Electric Boogie" with Marcy Griffiths. And um, we have three emerging artists. We have Mayan on that record also. We have Jamelia on that record. And we have the young lady you saw the other night, which is um, Amber Lee on that record. And that will be aired on Super Bowl tomorrow. So as I mentioned, uh, part of our responsibility at iHeartRadio is to create instant awareness because we're reaching 90% of America. And so today and tomorrow, we have a, a show called American Top 40 that is hosted by Ryan Seacrest. And uh, we're playing it for the first time on all of our radio stations that um, carry American Top 40, which is an enormous footprint in America and actually worldwide. But also, just, for us, just for us to do that, right, I had to do all of the press. So when you see me running in and out, running out, I was doing a ton of morning press setup by, by iHeart for me to hit every one of these radio stations across while I was doing this. So yeah, when Shaggy and I are chit-chatting, it's like, hey, Ryan Seacus is ready for you. Hey, Elvis Duran is ready for you. And, and he, that instantly puts him on 80 big, big radio stations in the U.S. Uh, you did Mojo uh, in Detroit. You did Fred in Chicago. Um, as so, so many people. Jubal, who hits so many different uh, right. markets across the country. And everybody loves Shaggy, by the way. And, and you know, I should say one thing, um, because it's not just about traveling and being accessible to your partners. It's being a good person. Um, I've seen it all. I've seen great People like Shaggy, you know, and Bono, you know, these people are the cream of the crop. I feel like they've seen it all, and you would expect the most successful people to be some of the most arrogant people, but they're not. And I think that's why they are the most successful people, is because they've always stayed grounded. Every single, every single, uh, on-air personality that called me after they did the interview, and most of them, by the way, are airing on Monday, and they're going to pretend, oh, we saw you at the Super Bowl oh, on the Super Bowl last night, and we'll play the song, and that, that's really what actually continues the groundswell. It's not just about being on the Super Bowl; it's the talk and the a long tail that happens after that, and that, that's part of what we do. And by the way, we're going to try to sell some Jeeps along the way because that is yeah, the commercial. It is a Jeep commercial, yes. I but uh, I think um, that's a lesson. It's um, people love to help good people. And again, I, I've seen a lot of people that have hits that aren't such good people, and they get the support throughout the music industry just because they have a good song. But when, when they hit the rough times, you know, it's like, I'm not going to help that person because they weren't, you know, they're just not a good person. But hey, Shaggy's got this new project coming out with Jeep, and he's redoing this song. It's a cultural song. It's a movement. And, and there's a lot of good things to talk about. Everybody's like, yeah, they were lining up instantly when I called all my uh, personalities across the country because he's a good guy and it's a worthy project. But I think I can't understand, understate the importance of being a good person. And building relationships. Remember I said where we go, we work the room. You go in. You're at, whenever you get an opportunity from this small island to actually go on a platform, like any iHeart stations, you walk in, you want to know where the PD at. I know everybody in the stations. I'm friends with all of them. I create relationships with all of them. I've known Tom for years. So if I ask Tom and I ask Bob, I say, hey, let, let Tom come down here. It's, it's you know, they're, they're rocking with me because I've always rocked with them. They call me and say, hey, I need this. I need this interview from you. I need this show. I need you on this road show. I need you this. We have a lineup going here. I am willing to do that right away. And that's part of being bankable, what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And we have to create that as we go along, uh, along the way. The part of it that I was talking about even is this, is when you look at the different formats. So say, for instance, a KTU plays a different type of a music, which, of course, KTU is in New York, and there is Z100, which is more of the pop 
top 40 station. So KTU is it's kind of a dance station, but is that what you call it? Yeah, right? it's a, we call it a rhythmic top 40 rhythmic uh, top station. 40. And it actually has a little bit more of a upper demo appeal, right. too. Um, in New York City, by the way, just to kind of go over the formats that we have. So we have a hip hop station with... Which uh, is... Which is uh, Power, uh, Power, uh, Power 105. Power 105. So they have Charlemagne in the morning also. So, so a lot of y'all know Charlemagne, the God. Yeah. Yeah. So we have Breakfast Club, who, by the way, that's a great launch pad also. If something yeah, is building cult cult times, cultural, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Charlemagne loves having you on the radio. It doesn't matter how big or small. If you, you have something that's happening culturally, um, that's a great launch pad. So, um, so we have our hip hop station, we have our top 40 station in Z100, K KTU, uh, which is sort of, yeah. it, it plays the more rhythm of the pop. And mm -hmm. then we have a classic rock station, Q104, and then we have 106.7 Light FM, which is sort of like the, um, the adult contemporary songs. So, so at KTU now, that's where we used to hear, I've heard like action and a couple of these really da big dancehall records. And the type of records they are, are really rhythmic type of records. Records that are, are they got hooks, they got, you know, they're fun records. They're what, is what we know as feel good records. And that's what KTU and a lot of these major pop stations want to play. They want to play feel good records. They want to make records that really resonate with their listening audience. So our job as, as musicians, Right, an artist is to provide the tool to, to Tom and his team so that they're not struggling to fit you in their format. You know what I'm saying? Which is what leads me back to the argument what I was saying from before. Create, don't be scared of creating hybrid. I told you the story about Bob Marley when Chris Blackwell told me that, hey, I had to get session musician because I wanted to get him on rock radio, right? And look what history has brought us now because that is now the blueprint of what reggae music is. Which, which started from, an, from a hybrid, you know what I mean? So that is kind of what the whole vibe of it is, why I'm actually touching on that point, because it makes your job easier as a programmer. Yeah, I think um, there's power to songs that kind of follow that mainstream pop formula, but push the edges so the consumer, the mass consumer, and I keep talking about the mass consumer because if you want to get a lot of listeners, that's part of the trick. Trying to make them feel cool, but in a very listenable, accessible way is, is definitely an art form. And people are always looking for what are the fringes happening in music right now? What's hot? You know, whether it's like Afrobeats or whatever it is, if a pop artist or just any pop station can have a song that feels like that, but still follows the mainstream pop uh, structure of a song, I find that those are incredibly successful. So I, I, I would encourage you, you know, stay true to your core, but don't be afraid of crossing over. Don't be afraid of crossing over. And the people that you're working with to help you cross over have to be students of the structure of what works in pop music. Um, because it's, it's sort of like what works with the human brain. It's like certain things are pleasing. People want to hear things that are um, melodic and uh, predictable, but at the same time push the edges, right? So if you can have a sound that is different and not like everything on the radio, that's great. Marry that with something that is kind of at the center, and I think that's really the sweet spot. If you, do, I, I like to just go back and look at what have been hits through the years, and those police songs. It made people kind of feel like they were cool in the mainstream, but uh, it kind of uh, still followed a formula. But it was very different. UB40, Red Red Wine was the same kind of thing. It's like it's very melodic. It's it's uh, very hit oriented. Uh, you, you make uh, the fringes of music accessible to the masses, it's going to work like a charm. And a lot of these songs, it, it, it's, you know, he might be talking about some of those songs, but no one is saying that you should step away from the culture. You should sell the culture. The culture is what makes it work. It's finding a way to bridge the culture, right, with what works with them. You know what I mean? And that's where the trick is. You want to sell the culture. What's happening to Afrobeat right now, why it's taking over, they're selling their culture. 
but it is these songs are so melodic that they they're grabbing an audience. You know what I mean? When you look on action, action was a song that was big in the streets. Big up, big up was a song that was in the streets. Mr. Boombastic was a record that was big in the streets, but there were also records that worked well on the top pop top forty format. Same record, nothing changed. It's just the way it was done. It was done in, in a hybrid style of way that really connects with that audience. And that is what we, need, we as a, a, a unit, as a art form, need to really pay attention to. That's a, that's a great point. If you can make it work for both buckets, the core bucket and uh, the, the mass uh, bucket that is adjacent to, to your core listeners, wow, you've really, you've really hit it. Yeah. So, in, in, the, in the whole interim of what radio is, so there are different territories. Most of the radio stations, when you think about the diaspora for reggae music, you, you might have New York, um, Aaron, would you say? New York, Boston, um, are those big radio markets you say? New York, Boston, Connecticut, yeah. Miami, uh, in the, say again? Atlanta. So those are mainly the big, where you have mm -hmm. a strong reggae diaspora, uh, a Jamaican Caribbean diaspora, right? And those, those areas are the areas which go. How can we get it out you know, to other? Because you might hear a guy, you, you, have, you have some songs like, for instance, like a whole Olio are them songs that did well in all those diasporas that you talked about, right? But if you go to Wyoming, not so much. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? How do you find, my thing is to try and have artists here to make records without sealing, records that have that ability that will work in these very remote places because they have that key sauce that works, you know, on, instead of just in the primary diaspora area. Is there a way that we at, at, or at iHeart or a program you know, whether it be a mix show in those, you might have a better mix shows in those diaspora era where you could support it and it wouldn't be too much of a problem. But when it comes to those remote places, how does that work? How do you, how would you get a record that's bubbling in those other places to work out there? Uh, well, it's communication. We talk, we, we make sure we have all our programmers linked together and they're seeing the, the data stories that are growing out of a Miami or uh, Atlanta and sharing that info, and eventually it makes it from that regional to, to the masses. You know, Wyoming is gonna need it to be pretty mass uh, by, before they play it. But I think it is really important that we always have the regionalization and the mix shows in those markets. Um, so, so yes, uh, we, we do always wanna be finding homes for a lot of different um, variants of, of music, you know? It, it, like our, our Latin stations in the US, we, we have uh, regional Mexican and um, um, Latin CHR, you know, in, in Latin pop. And they're very different from each other. And I, and I think the nuances change from city to city that you go to depending on the dominant um, uh, national origin of the population. So I think those nuances are, are very important. Um, and it, it's sharing the stories. And then we're looking at consumption at the market level um, to see also when we start to play a song, is that connecting? And if so, let's start to pay attention to it in other markets as well. When you look at the model of Y100, anybody know Y100 here? Anybody go Miami? So Y100 is the big pop station. It's, you would say the equivalent to like a Z100 in New York, yeah. right? Uh, or, or, or a Kiss FM in, 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 in LA. In LA, yeah. So Y100, but if you listen to that format, it is very uh, reggaeton friendly, you know, very Latin friendly on that, right? What I like about that because, and that was one of the few stations that really do that because of the Latin market. So that, the, the, the diaspora there is a very heavy Latin um, diaspora that, that is there. Right. Cubans and Colombians and you know, the Puerto, Puerto Ricans, they're all, they're all there. Latin music is very strong in Miami. So I would understand why, why Y100 would actually cater a lot more to that because the audience is actually big. Of but course. what is great about that is they have somehow figured out how to spawn from Miami 
into a song like Despacito and big, doing stars like, bigger stars like a Bad Bunny and all of those. That, these really started out of Miami, yeah. really. And uh, Bad Bunny is the biggest star in the world right now, uh, 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 globally. You know what I mean? But really, let's look at it. That really started out of that Miami, Miami situation. Yeah, and Despacito. So if we could support our diasporas a little bit more to build a story that you can really take the stories, the data from the stories, and spread it across the globe, right? Isn't that what you're saying? Uh, I, absolutely. I think, um, and by the way, I love the fact that Despacito really was the first full Spanish language mass pop hit. I mean, re really, when, when you look at how uh, that song transcended, that I think that was a moment in music. And I think um, uh, Latin and Spanish is something that we're constantly looking for because it's such a dom it's becoming um, such a large portion of the U.S. population. It's not, it's not a minority anymore. It's, it's the majority. And uh, we, we have to uh, recognize that and we have to look for those songs to cross. But yeah, it can happen um, with, you know, reggae or, you know, a any of these genres. Well, you've the seen way. a lot of that happen with the Afrobeat now, which is, yeah. which is an emerging market right now. It, it, it's, that is, would that be the next wave that you're seeing? It? Yeah, we're seeing it. And, and it's going to come in different forms. It's going to be uh, the ones that are influencing pop music, but then it's going to be uh, songs unto themselves that break into the uh, other formats as well. And you've been doing well with a lot of them on, on, on most of your stations uh, uh, as far as uh, um, uh, Afrobeat songs, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the styles that we're constantly tracking. And I think there's also needs to be an evolving willingness of the local program directors to understand that this is an opportunity. It's no longer a fringe. It's becoming really part of the mainstream. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's a focus of our programmers. And what I notice is this. Even though you might, you might have records that are starting from the base, I always say the sound system guys are your guys. Because when you look at an Aria and a Grande and these people, when they're coming out, their rollout is $5 million. We don't have that. Okay? And, and nobody's going to spend that, no matter how much money. And you and I spend that, you know, for rollout on no record. You know what I mean? Uh, it just doesn't make financial sense to, to, to do that when you're, Five percent, less than five percent of the market share, but you could build to that, right? You could start it out from from your sound system guys, which are your tastemakers and, and and your DJs, you know, from your Sean Bees to your Specs the Boss to all of these guys, and let them create that buzz. Then once that create the buzz, you're creating data, right? That data is then picked up by these guys that will help it go, and that that means that artist now has to go and with the data that's being created, you're gonna have to work the work the record you're going to have to go to every radio stations you're going to have to work your socials you're going to have to do all of this to make the record go up that ladder as it go so what he was saying that that it has changed a bit where now uh the record it used to be first you got to get on radio now you get through all the platform the TikTok, the youtube you know what i mean create that buzz right and then when you want your record when your record is bubbling and doing well and you're going and you're doing shows you go to these guys, and these guys make it global. So what tends to happen with a lot of artists is when, they, when it's at the pace where the clubs are popping it. You know what I mean? You hear it in the clubs. It's, it's on TikTok. You know, YouTube is popping it. They're doing their little shows here and there. They're making their little 15 grand and 20 grand on their show. They don't want to come do iHeart for less than that. They don't, because if, if it's a new artist, iHeart is not going to pay top money for you to come on their, their shows. You're going to come in sometimes. You're going to want to swap plays for a show. You know what I'm saying? But they don't want to let, do that. And say, yo, I'm not going to take that. I'm getting 20 grand a show. What me I do that for? I'm not going to go over here and do Z100 for interviews and free. And that's a big mistake. That happened to me when I was doing BBC years ago. I was offered, a, a, it was in Oak Carolina, I was offered $40,000 at that time to do a show in Birmingham when Radio 1 asked me to come on their road show for free. And now I had to be like, free, 40,000 pound. Free, 40,000 pound. I took free. But oh, Carolina was the number one. And you know what? I made 10 times the amount of that 40 grand. You have to think beyond that. 
You know what I mean? So when these guys have that platform to take you, once your record's going there, when these guys call you, you have to be on that stage and say, hey, I'm going there and I'm going to work that radio station. I'm going to go through every one of them. And I'll add to that. It's not like we're looking to take advantage. It's we're looking to partner and give you a next platform, right? It, it, it's just opening you up to expand. And like you said, it's, it's going to lead I mean, to... Y'all a, don't do it free all the time. I'm just saying at a level. Yeah. Because I, y'all pay me. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's getting, they pay me. I'm on Shaggy's but, Billions now. It's that new show I heard about in the last panel. But, but uh, you know, there was, there was a building to that. Everything goes up to that. You know, when you, it's back to the argument of leverage. It's getting leverage up there to where they will be able to bring you in on that. But they have a huge platform that you can yeah, share. Yeah, look, it's about a partnership. Um, we do a show called Jingle Ball. Um, in in New York that I started when I first got to Z in 96 and then now we have about 11 different markets that we put it on and uh, there's a lot of anchor personalities that continue that image that this is the biggest show like Lizzo did it this year, Dua Lipa you know, and a bunch of others but then there's also emerging artists like Jax is, is really big now after this song Victoria's Secret that um, you know, we, we don't pay her as much. We cover her expenses. We don't want her to take a loss. But putting her in the mix of that context of these are the biggest pop artists playing at Madison Square Garden, that's meaningful. It's like, wow, that, that, that puts you in a new light. And it opens up sponsorship opportunities uh, yeah. with everybody but, but Victoria's Secret. <laughs> but but uh, her career just continues to explode. And um, I just think, you know, she's a, a great example of somebody that is just real smart about it. It's like, yeah, I want to get on uh, Z100's Jingle Ball. She told me um, when I first offered it to her that that was more important because she grew up in, in Jersey and she always uh, wanted to win tickets to go to Jingle Ball when she was a little kid. And so it, it meant something to her. But she also knew that it was kind of a sign that she had made it because she could play at Madison Square Garden. She told me my goal wasn't to win a Grammy, it was to make it to the, the Jingle Ball stage. Wow. Because she knew that that was going to mean something to her personally that she really hit a milestone. I, I, I felt the same, same sentiment also because it wasn't really about, about the awards. You know, I, I'm more for the rewards. You, know, you could spend that. But um, it, it was really when you start selling coliseums by yourself. When Hot Shot happened, and we were doing these coliseums and selling them out ourselves. It, there's a feeling of satisfaction that, wow, everything that you did, all those hours in the studios, all those hours on market and promotion really paid off. Yeah. You know, and that was good. But the relationship I stress on again, because it, it, it is good that even at my time when there was a downtime for me, I caught, uh, you know, I was off radio for a minute. I got dropped from my label. You know, I just changed managers. I was in a really, really bad place. And um, I caught I Need Your Love. And you know Bonnie, uh, uh, Marnie. Marnie, who was, uh, uh, Red was a little independent, was a, uh, uh, the independent arm of, of Sony at that point. So it was a very little one-off deal I did with them, but I wrote I Need Your Love, put it on, and I started to go back up the charts. And I hit every single radio station with that and the good thing is that because of the relationship with you and Bob and Marissa and all of them, you guys put me on a lot of great platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when we did uh, in, in Vegas. Vegas, the iHeartRadio Music Festival. The festival. And they put me on that. And, you know, I just had my one record that was going, you know what I mean? And it wasn't like it was doing really, really well. It was doing well, but it was well enough for them to say, hey, let's give Shaggy a shot. And they had... You know, you guys have access to every single artist in the world, the biggest of the biggest. But you guys put me on that stage with them, and I needed it at that yeah. time. And we ended up getting, got, getting the Red into Top 5 on radio, you know what I'm saying, which spawned us to, to, to move on to other things, you know what I mean? From that one record, I had record companies trying to sign me because I was on Red, which is a little independent, and they tried to give me major deals at that point. I refused all of them because I didn't want to go back into a record, com record deal with a major because... I saw that the future was not going to be these majors. You know what I mean? I'd rather to go it on, on the independent route, and I kept it going that way. 
but the relationships is what really got me in that in that position. Yeah, yeah you're a friend. Um, and also, when he gets on stage, he crushes it, you know. And so we we knew that uh, putting him on in the mix, uh, you know, it's like in the iHeartRadio Music Festival in Vegas. What we try to do is get the biggest artists we can find uh, from every different genre. So you'll have like Red Hot Chili Peppers next to Drake, next to um, Kenny Chesney, and it's it's like the most crazy eclectic mix. Uh, but everybody, yeah, you, know, you know, we've had Paul McCartney open the show one year. And you uh, two closed the show one year, and they all kind of said, you know, it's weird because you have to win the audience over like you've never, uh, you know, won over before. So, but, but it, you, you were great in that whole mix, but, um, you know, it kind of goes to show uh, the relationships do matter, and people always want to help people that um, have been good to you along the way and have helped you along the way. Sometimes you need me more than... Um, I do, and I need you more than you need me, and that's what that's what good relationships, business relationships are all about. Thank you again, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to open the floor to some questions, if anybody has any. Oh, oh there you go. Aaron has one. Uh, anybody with the mic? Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Anybody hey, have a good crossover record? <laughs> Aaron Talbert from VP. How are you? Good to see you. Good. How are you? Thanks for joining us, VP Records. Um, so I had a couple of questions regarding numbers, and I hope this won't be boring to the audience, but as you talked about, the 890 stations, I heard people you know, respond in the audience. So the volume of what you guys do, I think, would be worth sort of pointing out. And then my question really goes around this idea of developing records or regional records. You made quick mention about regional records. So um, I've seen the iHeart charts, uh, uh, they come across it each week. and so. Uh, across those over 800 stations in the U.S. only, the top 10 records per week, like the number one record would stream with you guys, how many stream, how many spins a, a week for a number one record? Ballpark. Uh, I need I need to uh, fact check that. <laughs> okay. I mean, what, what, what the number is, but yeah. So we in the we, range. we 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 uh, reach uh, 276. Uh, million uh, listeners a month, over 90% of the U.S. population. Um, we, we dominate every major format, whether it's uh, pop and, you know, like country, we have 130 country radio stations. We have hip-hop stations. We also have the biggest personalities. And I think now more than ever, personalities is key to that. Uh, we talked about Charlemagne a minute ago, uh, The Breakfast Club. Um, and you know, uh, you know, Elvis Duran, Ryan Seacrest, Bobby Bones in the country world. Uh, th these are all people that uh, help when they play the songs, give context to the music to the masses. Um, so I don't know where I'm going my with this, but we was, were talking about the <laughs> the, the, the reach was, of the radio stations and what we do. Well, the number of spins per week is yeah. somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty thousand spins for a yeah. number one record. Fifty thousand times in the U.S. across those eight hundred stations is a national record, like a top ten record. So if you think about the impressions on top of everything else going on, I'm going to pull it up a, while we're talking. It's a Keep phenomenal talking. number. So then my question was, in terms of regional records. You kind of define them in terms of some of the Latin records that are going on. What sort of spin range would those be in? Because I only actually see the iHeart top 20, I think, is what you guys send around. But I'm curious, on regional records, what sort of the range of spins compared well, to that? What we do is we use what we call total audience uh, spins. So we take, because I think this is hard to, in, in a streaming world, right, you'll look at the streaming numbers and those count individual impressions because like you and I add up to two if we're listening to, to one song. When you're listening to the radio at any given quarter hour, then it's you know a few hundred thousand people that are listening to the radio station and that same song plays. So you, you have to multiply um, th that way to figure out how that correlates uh, to the number of spins. We give out uh, what we call a titanium award each year, which is when an artist hits a billion total audience spins on our iHeart platform. And so, you know, we, we do about 25 of those or so a year. And that's, the, you know, that's a significant amount of airplay. So the regional ones, what you have to do is calculate if it's in Miami uh, and um, Atlanta and it's getting played in, say, a medium rotation that's 30 spins a week, 
you know, multiplied by a few hundred thousand that are listening to that radio station at any given time. So that's how that math works. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Oh, who's got the mic? Check, check. Yeah. Yeah, um, good day again. Um, thanks for being here, first of all. Um, my name is Yuji Diaz. Um, I'm just going uh, for the lead of Shaggy, where he's saying, basically from half line, may I shoot my shot? I just took the privilege again to slide in both of y'all DMs, and I just sent my hybrid song to both of you. So if you see a song come up named Feel Good Music, and by the way, that song was produced by a known superstar too, but I don't really want to call him name yet. You know what I mean? But you can't, when you check the stats, if you it's a new, If it's a, a known superstar, it'd be best to call him name because that helps your chances a bit more. All right, all right. That's Jif the reason why you use the known superstar. Uh, <laughs> all right. Egyptian. Okay, great. <laughs> great artist, Egyptian. And um, consequence music. Yes. So is that in my inbox now? Yeah, it's definitely in your inbox. Yes. By, by the way, one thing that I should also point out is if you have a song, make sure it's getting loaded to all the DSPs, including iHeart, right? I mean, I know yours is, but I'm just for, for the rest of the room because that way it auto-populates into our system. And so if we start to see something bubbling, you, you got to make sure you're, you're up there and it'll get immediately featured. The main thing is to get on their radar, right? And it's, it's getting on radars in, in every single, you know, sector of the game. You know, some people come up to me and say, oh, Shaggy, I have a song for you. And I mean, more and more, you do a tune. And I'm looking at your numbers. You have no numbers. You have nothing. And you want me to figure. So you want me to give my 15 million monthly subscribers, right? And all of them things. When me take 30 years and bill, and me for just give it to you just so because you come up to me and say you want one. All right? And then when me tell you, say, no, you have to work your way up to my, to my level. You gotta be on, you gotta work, you gotta get on my radar. When you see me do a song with Spice, Spice got on my radar. When you see me do a song with, with TJ, TJ worked up to my radar. You know, I'm not just gonna take you just from scratch, like not like that. When, what are you bringing to the table? You know what I mean? When I'm looking at your whole thing and finding out that, you know, how dedicated you are, how long have you been doing this? Who are your audience? What is it that you're trying to do? When Spice hit me, Spice, did, how I got involved with Spice was the same way that you just did. You went in my DM. Spice DM me and says, hey, I want to do a collaboration with you. I know Spice. She's on my radar. But I wasn't into Spice that, like that. I had to go research Spice. In researching Spice, I realized there was a bunch of songs that she had put out. And then I listened to the song and I just thought, well, these can be better songs. Because a lot of them weren't really well produced. And once I spoke to her, I said, hey, um, you know, I'm hearing a couple of your songs that are a little flat, a little sharp, little, you know, the production ain't right. And she looked at me and said, Shaggy, I'm here one. May I do everything myself? I'm not a producer. I'm here. Just I do my thing. I might take a rhythm from my man and vice it myself and send it back. So these guys might be producers, but they send her the rhythm because she's spice, but she's got the vocals and she's doing it. So the song isn't arranged properly, right? Um, they might not be vocal, the most vocal produced properly, none of that. So when she came to us, that was hard for her to break into because now I'm vocal producing her. I'm sitting down here and saying, hit the piano and say, no, that's wrong, that, that is wrong, you're flat. You, and she can't hear it, you know? But by the time we were done with that, her ears was trained enough to get what I was saying and then we become, uh, it become a situation where we start making really great records. And I mean, so, you have to work your way up to getting on the radars. The minute we're on the radars, then, hey, wow, this is hot. We're going to go with that. You know what I'm saying? So just so I know and I've worked for the will work for the and always try to be on the radar. Yeah, yeah. By the way, um, I checked uh, this week. Um, our most played song across iHeart stations was Metro Boomin, uh, Creepin'. Uh, 40, so like in one week with all those radio stations, 43,229,000 um, total audience spins. So that just kind of gives you an impression of, you know, and so you, you know, Metro Boomin's obviously... I would love to hear a reggae record doing that right now, man. Jeez. Wait, I'm looking up Shaggy. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what? I'm going to add up all the times that we have played your song, and we'll give it a real well, big Well, I have what is known as recurrent, recurrent songs. That's <laughs> another thing that you need to, to, to do. When you make songs, make songs that are... That are um, longevity. Longevity records. Records that will last decades. Because what will happen, you get so many residuals from what is recurrent plays. There's a lot of my, a lot of my catalog that's on iHeart that's a recurrent playing on iHeart. Uh, you know, throughout these 800 and odd radio stations throughout the thing, and it generates for us over and over again. And so that's important. Can I add to that? I think it drives me crazy when um, the labels push the next song so fast on the heels of the previous one because it's killing your opportunity for longevity. There's so much money to be made when you make it from a current to a recurrent and a gold on radio. My God, to, to, when, you, when you cut short the lifespan too fast because they want to push another song out, that, uh, it, it's such a shame. I see it all the time. Those that make it uh, as a recurrent reap the rewards. It, it's kind of like the insurance policy we were talking about on the last panel, you know? It's like you want those songs that radio plays over and over again. Yeah. Next. I, I, I'm very happy to be here Which part today. Which today? Oh, sorry. Una pesta no, una guava lighta, so we can't see a brother. Yes. Yeah, this is. Like the jacket, you see, the bright jacket. Yeah, yeah. You say, I try to show up the thing. Yes. Ah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm West Rock, a Jamaican country reggae artist. I fuse country music with reggae music. And so I'm happy to be here today to meet you, Tom Pullman. You know, um, I art, I know, is the biggest thing in US radio. And uh, to, to learn that you have 130 country stations, you know, um, I just want to put in my request from now. <laughs> okay, got it. You know? Got it. West Rock. Send it West over. Rock. <laughs> you know what? I mean, uh, and Gramps was uh, t talking to me about the crossover country reggae, and uh, I think that's a great, great opportunity. So you never know what's coming next. All right. Um Good afternoon, Tom and Shaggy. My name is Travis Graham, co-manager for female reggae artist, Yeza. I have a very quick three-part question. How do you view reggae, well, Tom, how do you view reggae and dancehall music among other genres through the lens of iHeartRadio? And what strategy do you use in selecting curators for your reggae and dancehall playlist? And who are the reggae and dancehall artists on your radar and why? Um, well, I think the first thing that we look for, for it, is to pop up in the number of streams, right? It's, we, we sort of, like at Pop, for example, we look at five million streams a week sort of as, okay, we know that that really has a good shot of make, you know, becoming a hit. Over 10 million, we usually will put that into call-out research, and it, and it sort of becomes an automatic right, you know, 15 and 20 million. Like, th those uh, stats are really undeniable. I think that radio missed a lot of those records in the past, quite frankly, and we needed to become educated on those different benchmarks. But now what we've done is we've tracked if an artist is at a million streams, this is what we can expect. You know, it's a little bit more of a hit or, hit or miss when they hit five million, then it puts it... And it, by the way, it's different for every format. I'm just giving you the pop stats because I do those meetings every week. Um, and you know, it's not to say that you have to have the, those number of streams, but we've just found that those are sort of the benchmarks that we look for. Um, but uh, in terms of the curators, we'll have mixers uh, at each of the radio stations that uh, help us curate the playlists on the app. So, so um, again, about the ecosystem of iHeart, it's those um, 880 radio stations, that, the broadcast radio stations, we also have an app. Uh, that focuses a lot on podcasting. That's an area that we've gotten heavily involved with. We're the number one podcast publisher in the U.S. We distribute the podcast everywhere, but our podcasts themselves have about 369 million downloads a week. So that's also a part of the equation that I think we all need to be thinking about as artists. Is like there's a huge opportunity to get into podcasting, um, but. So I'm sort of giving you the, the overall ecosystem of, of what we're looking at, and you asked about the curation. So we have that app 
that you know, like a Spotify, uh, we'll, we'll have the different playlists on there. And when we're programming our radio station, we'll look at the the songs that are bubbling up and emerging. So, and how, how do you view? How does iHeart view reggae dancehall music? I think uh, you know, artists like Coffee get integrated into a lot of our hip hop radio stations. We're always looking for somebody that can either become part of the overall mix of our hip hop or urban stations or our urban AC stations or our pop radio stations. Um, so we're open to it, um, always looking for the next sound. The thing that I love about my job is I wake up every day to new music and I never know where that next hot thing is coming from. It can be from a rock genre, it can be from a rhythm genre, whatever it is, you know, if it's different, but it's still melodic and kind of following you know, what works with the mainstream, you know, we're, we're always open to it. Yeah. And I really don't know the answer to this. Um, corporate America is very, I, corporate America seems to be very cagey about associating themselves with what people might consider to be people within questionable, people that have questionable um, ties to the underworld. And increasingly, popular music within the black sphere, especially amongst young men, it seems to be linked to the underworld. That's, that's a comma. However, every underworld has a female um, girlfriend, and it seems that these women now, they learn the craft of the men, but they don't have the taint of the underworld, of the boyfriends. And they don't have the facial tattoos. They're a lot more marketable, it would seem. And I'm trying to understand if there is, if it's luck that the biggest popular artists, dancehall and reggae artists, Coffee, Shensia, you have Megan Stallion, you have a lot of other people like that, that there are women that are coming to the fore now. And is it because they are benefiting from corporate America backing them and actually shunning the men, because corporate America is afraid of being tainted with potential links to the underworld. And it's also radio, and, and, a, and a part of that is, is it also, also feeding into radio? Why, when you're doing your checks as to what is the next best thing, you're also looking at, can we play this artist on the radio and not risk getting a backlash because this person might be in a month time, accused of some huge crime, what? right? Because of so, are we afraid road. to play songs because of the background of the artists? Yeah. No, right, good. I mean, typically not. I mean, I. It's, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, can you help translate what? I, what am I missing? <laughs> no, you did it right. Exactly, it is. You said it exactly right. It, 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 it does, you know, I don't think, in my, from my experience, I don't think it is based on, on you know, where your background is or what. It is. If you have a hot song and it's bubbling and, and it fits yeah. within their format, they're going to go with it, you know. They don't care what, you, what tattoos you have. It's just really, to be honest with you, the women out of dance have been kicking ass. That's, that's the bottom, that's, yeah. They've been kicking ass. They've been doing it way better than the dudes, I'm sorry, you know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, from Shensia to Spice to Coffee to all of them, they have been Mayan, they've been doing their thing. And we just have to support the fuck out of it. That's what it is. Yeah. And the dudes need to step their game up, you know what I mean? Right? I mean, how much rifle dance, how much rifle dance I'm not gonna do. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you know, I I mean it's just it's just bottom line. I'm not saying you're not supposed to have a mixture of everything, but we, we, you know, we all know, we're not a dancer, and I hear it just like a one way. It's like, yo, and, and, and I'm cool if it's one way and it's working. You know, if you say right for dance or this or that or whatever you want to call it, or you do a bunch of gun tune and you're getting numbers and it's going on iHeart and we're selling numbers, I'm going to make my gun tune too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to figure out we're out another thing too. But the bottom line is it's not working. You know what I mean? So why beat the dead horse? It's not happening, bro. So follow the ladies. They're doing something that is working and you know, you know, they're just doing it better. Anybody else? 
Yes, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, Mr. Where you are? Over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> right behind the camera. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Hi, good afternoon. I just wanted you to speak a little bit more about the podcast in space. You said you didn't get to touch on it, and I'm very interested to hear, like, what is that niche? How can that niche be merged with music to be um, more substantial here in the Caribbean? People love stories. People love stories about music. Um, and I think it's a space that is still in its infancy, but it is absolutely exploding. That's why we as iHeart and Bob Pittman, <clears throat> we're like, okay, this is, we wanna, we wanna specialize in audio, right? To, to either play music, it doesn't really matter how it's received, whether it's on a AM, FM radio, or it's on this thing, which is basically a radio. Um, but if it's a story being told that's like a personality on a radio station, and it's on-demand radio, basically. And some, some of our big podcasts are people like uh, Charlemagne the God, you know, talking about the same things that he talks about on the morning show and different cultural issues. But, um, and, and we've signed a lot of artists to tell their stories about music, and we want to do more. Uh, of that. Uh, in fact, uh, we've done deals with Dua Lipa and others. Well, I, anybody who's big, I, I will usually talk to their manager and say, <clears throat> you know, have you ever thought about doing a podcast? Because you've got a story to tell and we would love to help you do that. Um, at iHeart, um, we have a unfair advantage because we can create awareness of a podcast as well. So what we'll do is we'll play excerpts of that podcast on all of our radio stations so you can get instant familiarity. We also have a uh, team of salespeople in every single market. So that's uh, a, a way to monetize the podcast as well. And then when we send it out to all the distributors, they take the ads with them. So we create the awareness, but we also have the monetization ability. So. Um, we're going to keep growing, and I think if you're a developing artist or an established artist, you got to be thinking about a podcast. Is that a hint? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it now, Mr. Uh, Shaggy Billions. Let's add to him. <laughs> well, if I have the last one, I think Judy is signaling us. Right. Got you. Good afternoon, uh, gents, and thank you for uh, this enlightening discussion. Um, one of the things we've heard a lot about uh, is your reach. Um, but we haven't talked a bit about, you know, the potential revenue. There's been a lot of discussion in the industry around radio play rates versus streaming rates. Could you um, just talk a bit about how that compares? Yeah, I mean, the the rates for broadcast, you know, we we the publishing is what we've always focused uh, on in our rate structure because that's the way the music industry was built through the years, right? So, you know, like it, it, we we pay. I think it's still about. 3% of our revenue to uh, the songwriters. Um, and then if it's streamed, like our, our broadcast radio stations that are streamed, um, we add in also the, the streaming rights. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're proud of the checks that we're getting into the music industry because it is such a, uh, a big part of uh, what we're paying for, but we do think it's also a reciprocal relationship that we're creating awareness uh, for those songs to become hits. You know, like I talked about the, uh, you know, 45 billion on air impressions to, to build a, a song that ultimately can drive streaming uh, as well. So, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we love to see the music industry healthy and we want to be a part of helping people continue to make money thank you tom hey thanks everybody uh we're run out of time right now i hope this is in informative informative and um informative i should say and uh you know stay tuned for the next panels and thank, thank you. you i really appreciate uh getting to know everybody um it's been some great discussions and i hope to have more much Thank you very much, Orville Shaggy Burrell and Tom Pullman.